You're listening to the Rent Roll Radio Show with Sterling Chapman. Hey, Rent Roll Radio listeners. We're back here today with Sonny Rao from Griffix Property Group. Sonny, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So, Sonny, could you give us a little deep dive into, you know, your background, what you did before real estate, how you got involved in real estate, and kind of just tell us the story? Oh, definitely. So, I like to joke that real estate is my third retirement plan. Um, My first retirement plan started when I was very young. I actually played tennis professionally for about 10 years. I turned pro when I was 14, retired when I was about 23. And while that was successful in itself, the monetary returns weren't quite what I wanted because the expense base for that is like really high, you know? So after, after I retired from the pro tour of 23, I had dropped out of school after sixth grade in order to pursue that full time. So I kind of found myself almost maybe a Wait, little over 10 years ago. You, you dropped yeah. out of school <laughs> in the sixth grade? Yeah, I mean, I'd say I had to. Is that even? Thing, there's air quotation. Is, is that, that even legal? legal? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my parents are in jail, so <laughs> nobody really. I mean, it's like there's just very different nuances to the sport. You know, that was more of a normal life. You can't train full time, and when kids are turning pro very young and expected to like make these big bucks when they're teenagers, there's just no room for school. Got it. So my education kind of like fell by the wayside. <laughs> while I pursued other dreams. So about a little more than 10 years ago, I found myself in my early 20s, having retired from the tour with really like no skill sets, no life skill sets, no education, no idea of how the world worked because like I had spent my entire life trying to improve my skill set in like this concrete arena, right? But that didn't serve me anymore. So after retirement plan number one was done, I moved on to retirement plan number two, which was the corporate world. So I went back to community college, took like all the remedial classes, got myself an academic scholarship to a private business school up in Boston. I was based out of Florida when I retired. So like got my undergrad degree, got a job, thought life was awesome. I finally had like a stable paycheck. I knew how much money was coming in, what was coming in. Like I was just like living the dream, I thought, you know, because I I had spent so many years with kind of a scarcity mindset and with very scarce financial reserves. However, I started to realize that there was a price to pay for that stability. And that price was having to put work above anything and everything that I valued if I wanted to give into my ambitious needs, you know? Sure. So after about two years of that, it didn't take me very long or three years. It didn't take me very long to grow disillusioned. I made the choice to seek a different path in conjunction with my corporate job so that I could have better influence over my financial future. And at first, like, I didn't know what that looked like. I still didn't have a ton of money. I had started grad school. I just knew like, my job wasn't working out with like between office politics and the time needed, et cetera, et cetera. Looked into a whole bunch of different options, everything from like travel hacking, credit card hacking, couponing, like I had no idea where to start, right? And I eventually found real estate. And that was like the moment that the pieces fit for me. Everything clicked together because there's so many parts of the business model that I really like. So I made that decision about like three and a half years ago. But as I said, at the time, I didn't have a ton of money. I was working full time and I was going through an MBA program. So having to pay for that, there was just, and I didn't have much time. But after years of being a professional athlete, I knew what it was like to hustle. So any time I had, I would put towards like studying real estate. Like just, I didn't have money, but I could educate myself until I got to a point where I could invest, right? And I wasn't comfortable with taking other people's money just yet until I'd like, tested myself out and proved that I can do it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it spent about a year and a half, almost two years studying. And then two years ago, invested in my first property. So in these last two years, I've focused on the smaller residential space just to improve my skill set and start building out this business. And I also was working full time. And of the last two years I've invested, one year that was spent also still in grad school. You know, so, and I'm currently still working my full time job. So, like, my time constraints have been very, very tight. Nonetheless, 
in the last two years, I've built a portfolio of seven doors that I'm slowly growing as I get more time and accelerate and learn. I'm learning how to take on investors and grow this business in other ways that doesn't just rely on my W-2 income. So seven doors, that's seven single family houses? That is two duplexes and then three single families. I have to do a math in my head. <laughs> I, I do that every time too. I, I count yeah. on my fingers. Like what is that made up of again? <laughs> <laughs> I always get the duplexes mixed up. I was seven or eight duplexes. I always get those mixed up. Yeah. So what was your first deal? What did that look like? How'd you get into it? That's actually one of my favorite deals. It was off the MLS, surprisingly. And my strategy going and especially with my first properties, I'm very fiscally conservative. And I wanted to cash flow, but I also wanted to get into the best area that I could afford while still cash flowing at the time. Because from what I had seen in my research and the trends, like net worth grows a little bit more quickly in like the higher class assets. And I wasn't interested in investing only for appreciation. You know, like that's speculative. But I did want to get into a place where I could set my life up so that by the time I left my corporate job, it was pretty stress-free. And I felt like investing in a more stable tenant, higher class tenant base versus going into like a C, C minus class where the projected cash flows would be higher, but it would probably be more stress for the rest of my life. Like that wasn't yeah. a trade-off I was going to make. <laughs> I definitely won't echo that a hundred percent. I agree. And I've even like gotten more aggressive in that direction, the further I went along. So, you know, when you look at those like D class areas, it's like spreadsheet cash flow magic, you know, it's like, Oh my yeah. God, I can make so much money. But then when you like, you hear so many horror stories and when you get out there, you're like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm going to get shot, you know? And that's, <laughs> that's yeah. like not really the situation I want to be in. And those will never, ever appreciate. If anything, they're going to go down in value over time. So Agreed. Man, unless you have some gentrification come through, but that's pretty rare. And for you to do it yourself, you'd have to own the whole block or the whole several blocks. So it's, I'm with you. I've elected to stay out of the really bad areas that a lot of my friends are making a ton of money in and they're comfortable yeah, in that yeah. and, and they've got systems in place to handle it. But I just, it just wasn't Good like for them. I, I'm like you, I got a full-time job, but I got an eight month old baby. I, I can't be spending, you know, hours on hours on end every day, chasing people down, banging on their door, trying to collect rent. Yeah. I don't get shot, you know, <laughs> I was more aggressive on the front end about getting cash flow because my initial thought process was not necessarily retirement, but it was more like a safety net if something were ever to happen mm. in my corporate job. So I was like real eager to build up that cash flow. But now that I've got that cash flow and that safety net in place, like I like, I'm like you. Now I'm looking, I'm not going to buy anything that doesn't cash flow, but I'm looking for more equity plays, you know, building yeah. up my net worth, something that's going to appreciate. And I'll take a lot lower cash flow and kind of build up that like long term gain. So I definitely, I, I, yeah. I applaud your, your, your research and your decisions to go there. And I'm definitely following suit. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't regret it at all. Like I know as I initially I was like, what am I even doing? My I had fellow investor friends who were making like 600 bucks a door easy, you know, but then they turn around and one's telling me a story about how his tenant is unscrewing the doors from his house and then selling them for first, <laughs> like porch, you know, and I was like, I don't, I don't have those problems. <laughs> you a know? AC units, they'll sell AC units. It seems like they'll sell anything that they can get their hands on, yeah. you know, and my units have been like filled very easily, even at like pretty inopportune times, you know, and at whatever I ask. So I can't really complain. And also like that first purchase that I made. So like I bought it at like 95 K it was a two, one, a two bedroom, one bathroom main house, and then a detached one bedroom, one bathroom carriage house. I paid 95 for it end of last year, end of 2019, I packaged like five of my doors into a commercial refi under my business and had all my properties appraised. That property appraised for 50% more than I paid for it. And I could use that equity as a line of credit to reinvest, which I thought was very valuable as well. So it's not just, I think it's important like how you evaluate like your growth strategy as well. Like I had hoped for some like appreciation so that I could kind of skim off equity, although it's harder to do with investment properties, but that's definitely something else that I think 
people need to keep in mind when they go into investing. Absolutely. So how did you originally buy that first property? Was it, you said you refinanced into your business name. So I imagine when you first bought it, you you bought it in your personal name. So did you just mm-hmm. do it, do it like a traditional, like 15 yeah, or 20% down? Yeah, I think it might've down? been 25%. 20 or 25% down. Yeah. And then I paid like the rehab was like another, I would say 15,000 on top of that, maybe 10,000 on top of that. Yeah. And how much does it rent for? So the main house rents for 800 right now, but I think I can bump that up when the lease ends in July. I got a two year lease in place immediately. So there haven't been any vacancies or turnovers. The carriage house, I, turned into an Airbnb last fall. And what we're recording is end of March. So March has been rough with the coronavirus. Sure. sure. Um, I interviewed somebody yesterday. He's going to kill me if he hears this and he will hear it too. But I interviewed somebody yesterday that their entire business is Airbnb and they've been shut down altogether. Horrifying. He's not even legally allowed to operate for two months. And he had just quit his full-time job in January because oh. he was he was making so much money doing it. So, Yeah, he must have been crushing it for a long time. But now with like health issues and whatever impact that will have on the economy, it's definitely a scary time for Airbnb. Prior to this, even though it was new and I was like learning the ropes as I went along, it, it was probably I was netting my worst month. I netted, I think it was 700 bucks for that unit, but my best month netted about two grand. Oh, nice. So the, where are your properties? In the Indianapolis suburbs. And that's where you live. So they're, they're all close. Now it, I, I moved out here last year. Yeah. I was actually a long distance investor for my first year. I was oh, living cool. in Boston. And then I decided that I wanted to just like commit and be all in and expedite the growth of my portfolio through being on the ground and building the networks that I needed to build and build the relationships that I needed to build in order to grow this more quickly. So I moved out here almost exactly a year ago. It was March 28th of 2019 when I moved out here. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. How did you grow from there? What do your next few deals look like and how were you getting the capital to buy them? And I asked because I started with a very similar strategy. I bought two single family houses and put the down payment and then I was broke. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. After like I got a couple properties my first year and then after that I was like twiddling my thumbs going, okay, what now? (laughs) Yeah, let's go back to work for two more years to save another down payment. (laughs) Yeah, it's horrifying. So I have been, of the seven doors I purchased, four were conventional. One I purchased through seller financing in in terms of like a bundle deal because I bought another property conventionally and he was like, all right, I'll hold this note for six months. You pay me interest in six months, we refi out and you exit me. So that's how I purchased one. Another one was a house tax, so I only put down like five or six cool. percent. And I'll move it's the house I'm in right now. I have a roommate and I'll be moving out of this fingers crossed in the summer to another house tax and rent this out to a family because it's pretty good size. And then the last one I finally started taking on investors. So I have like a debt partner who I gave him like the lien on the property and a fixed interest rate. And then I'll exit him in month seven. So that's, that's our agreement. So moving forward, obviously trying to minimize my cash in and work with investors to figure out exactly what their comfort level and their goal is in terms of working with me, but then also living a slightly nomadic lifestyle with like the house hacking because the interest rates are so much lower. Like that 1% and change between an owner occupant to a non-owner occupant can really make a difference over the life of the loan. Sure. Absolutely. And that was something that I found out the hard way because I bought my personal house and my interest rate was like 3.75. And then when I ignorantly went to go analyze these investment properties, I plugged in 3.75 for the interest rate and my heart was broken when I showed up and they told me it was six. (laughs) Yeah, right. I, I mean, someone I have someone at work actually mentioned that. And thank God that he did, because I had no idea when I was first running these numbers. There's a lot that people don't tell you a lot that isn't covered when you're brand new. <laughs> right. So would you do anything differently knowing everything you know today if you had to start over again? I toy with that idea sometimes. Because like you said, there's, there's, there's two things that I think about. One is 
hey, would it have been better to wait and then buy cash and refinance out? Maybe I would have more cash now. But I also know with the trajectory of the market, like my first five doors were all in like A minus areas. Like the towns next door and within the same school district were named by Money and Forbes magazine as like the best places in America to live. So now finding those prices, you can't. Like you can't, you can hardly find anything that cash flows that's decent in that area. And my appreciation keeps bumping up and I'm skimming off the equity as it goes along. So if I'd waited and like until I had that cash, I don't know that I would have gotten into these properties. I probably would have been relegated to a lower class area as the market went up in the last two years. So I wouldn't change that. There is one thing I would change, and that would be learning about FEMA floodplains. <laughs> yeah. So that was the one property I bought via seller financing. The numbers were incredible. I got it for 60 grand. It's in like an A minus area, three bedroom, one bathroom, one car garage. It rented for the rent is currently 1080, and it's slightly under market because I had to rent get it rented during like the November Christmas time frame in the dead of winter in Indiana. But my tenant's been there two years, so I'm not raising it too much because she's awesome. Like no stress. However, <laughs> flood insurance eats away at a lot, so I'm like trying to hoard up and trying to like I want to pay that sucker off so that and it's never it hasn't flooded in like I don't know how many years. Right. It's like the lowest grade of like that. I think if it was reassessed, it wouldn't be in a floodplain anymore, but it's only, it's just that much close enough to a river where there's a chance. It's so funny you say that because so I, I, a few months ago, I did Joe Fairless's podcast and it came out yesterday. And of course his marketing team, they'll like, cool, that's together. Really awesome. it, was, it was a surprise. I didn't think it was coming out till May. So it was, it was pretty cool. But he puts out these like marketing things with like my face and then like a quote next to it. And the quote that he put next to my face in this like little marketing poster or whatever was, I typically try not to buy things in flood zones because it really does eat away at <laughs> your cash flow. And I was like, is that really the most insightful thing I said? But if- <laughs> and it's also, is this what I want attached to my face all over the internet? Okay, I guess that's what we're going with. <laughs> that's funny, yeah. I mean, I did, I did ask my agent and he said it wasn't. And so, but I didn't think to double check. So trust, but verify and look up addresses on that floodplain all day. Yeah. So I don't know how they do it in Indianapolis. I have a little app on my phone that it's a Louisiana thing and I can just plug my addresses Mm. in. So that's like my first step after I like. What's that? (laughs) Well, (laughs) That's that's the first thing you do now. (laughs) Yeah, it is. I mean, it makes a big difference. I mean, sometimes it's not bad, but sometimes it it, it can be. I mean, you can have a $3,500 a year flood insurance policy. I mean. Yeah. Well, the first, the first FEMA quote I got was 5K a year. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was able to find a private insurer eventually and brought it down to one, but I'm still, it's only a 60K property. I want to pay that off within five or six years and pull that out because it's only, only needs to be like, needs to have the full flood insurance when bank finance, but there are other policies which will contain like a smaller piece of flood insurance, not as comprehensive, but so- having it under a policy that's small, it would help I, you say it's never flooded up there, and, and I'm sure it's a different environment than we're in down here. We're, I'm in South Louisiana, so we're right next to the Gulf. We had a major flood in 2016, and it wiped out a ton of, of homeowners and investors that were not carrying flood insurance. So I have a few properties that are in flood zones that are like older, cheaper properties that mm-hmm. I, I sell or finance. And so I don't carry flood insurance on there because it's never flooded and the guy's not requiring me to. But I almost feel better about the fact that some of my other properties force me to carry flood insurance because every time it starts raining heavy, I'm like, because <laughs> uh. it was a major. Yeah, at least you have a, some kind of hedge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like half and half. There was a, a ton of investors that got completely wiped out because they, they own their stuff cash and, and they didn't have flood insurance. So, but that, I mean, that's a major issue down here in South Louisiana. It doesn't sound like it's an issue up there, but, but yeah. Not as much. So you mentioned earlier, you have a debt partner. Is there a reason you elected to go that route versus equity? I mean, I, I like the debt partnerships too, 
but I'm just curious as to kind of how you came about that arrangement, if it's something that you want to continue to do it or, or if you evaluated the debt versus equity, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. I like, I like the debt partnership better because I get to make the decision more. No one else has an equity stake, you know, like there's a reason I started off small. I think I probably could have gone larger with other investors, but I want to learn the ropes, call the shots. I want the reason I'm in this is because I want more control over my financial future. I already have a job where other people kind of control how much I make, you know? So I like that I can make the decisions, but I also like the fact that as like as we're talking now, like the stock market's all over the place. You know, people are talking about what the economic impact of like businesses shutting down, what that's going to be like, impact to GDP, whether that's going to start a recession, et cetera, et cetera. And I also like the idea of getting more well versed in the debt partnership because I believe that I can provide maybe not, maybe there's more of it, there's definitely more of a ceiling with the debt partnership in terms of returns to the investors because they are getting a fixed rate. However, in a time of uncertainty, this can be kind of like a hedge against their other investments because they know what they're getting and they have a mortgage, a lien against the property, you know, and how much do they put in is worth far less than what it's actually worth. So like the property I got was probably probably worth around 95 to 100, I would think, pre-rehab and my investor put in 75. You know, after I'm done with the rehab, I cover the rehab. It should appraise between 120 and 130. If at any time I don't perform, he gets the property, which is worth far more than his investment. It's very important for me to take care of the people I work with. Absolutely. Can I ask what kind of interest rates you're paying? Yeah, I mean, I'm paying 9%. Oh, wow. So that's good. Yeah, I don't mind sharing that. Yeah, I want to make sure people are comfortable. Like I, it's essentially at the end of the day, I get a cash flowing asset with very little of my own money in. So I want, even if I have to pay a little more, I'm more than happy to do so to create like a win-win relationship so that everyone is happy at the end and we can work together basically forever. <laughs> like yeah. every, this entire business, what I love most is that it's about relationships and working with good people who are like-minded. Like, I mean, you have a day job too. You don't get to choose who you work with and that can just ruin like your day at times. Yeah. So I'm very intentional about how I build the business that will carry me into the life that I dream of. Yeah, no, I I definitely love that concept. I ran into somebody the other day that that I was looking at buying something from and and I just didn't like him and I just didn't want to work with him. It dawned on me that I didn't have to. Like, I don't. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? (laughs) (laughs) You know, when I got, when I got jerk customers in my day job, like I have to, or a jerk coworker, I just have to deal with it. But I went the other day and I was like, I don't really want to work with this person. Oh, I don't have to. So that's cool. That, that is yeah, my favorite thing. So like everybody on my team from like my property manager to like the two lenders I work with to like my agent and even like my handyman, I can text them all at one in the morning and be like, guys, I need help. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, yeah, what's up? They're all like, we've become legitimate friends because we actually like who the other human is. And it's that has made my life so much better. Like, we can talk business and go have a margarita. Like quality of life is high. Absolutely. Awesome. So what's next for you? I'm in the process of reevaluating that, honestly. It really depends on what happens in the next few weeks or so with the market. My goal is definitely to start going larger. Staying in the sub four unit residential space is not for me forever. I think that there will be opportunities there until the housing market starts to reflect what is happening economically. And I think at that point, that will be when I want to move into the commercial space. With the way cap rates have kind of compressed in the the last few years, especially across the different asset levels, I think it's going to be hard for some owners who essentially purchased for long term and current break even, it's going to be hard for them to maintain their cash flow and hold on to their properties. So I think there's definitely going to be a decompression. And when that happens, I'm definitely going to be moving into commercial, but it, it just might take a little time. So until then, continue to build those networks, continue to build that education, continue to build my portfolio as it is while keeping an eye to like scale up in the next few years. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. What advice do you have for our listeners that are interested in getting started investing in real estate? These, 
to like, um, guys are so cliche, but <laughs> like one, like educate yourself. You know, there's, there's a fine line between paralysis and analysis, but there are too many people who have also reached out to me without, like, since I started doing these podcasts, like reached out for like, to have that conversation who just clearly don't understand the nuances, you know, and all the factors that will impact an investment. This is not putting in the stock market and forgetting about it. Like if you want to have more influence over your investment, you've got to understand the factors that influence that investment. That's like maturity of tenant. That's how like your cash flow is going to be impacted by like different job growth. What kind of jobs bring people to the area? What are the dynamics of that area? What are they looking for? There's a million factors and you have to understand that. And then recently I actually gave a slightly different answer <laughs> because it's been this, this environment that we're in, it's unprecedented for many investors because there's so many new investors that have come in after the last recession. And so going into a time of more instability, it's hard to know which way the cat's going to jump and which way you should move. So I think it's also really important to build your network. And by network, I mean, make friends. So go out there and be stiff and be like, Oh, you're so inspiring. No, like, <laughs> get a beer, like get some ass, like learn what other people are like and make actual friends who are also like-minded because those are the people who are going to keep you sane and who are going to like help you when times get tough and you're going to do the same for them, you know? So building that, that support system, especially as we head into certain times is, is critical. Absolutely. Awesome answer. So now we're going to head into our radio round and I apologize with all of our technical difficulties getting started. I didn't give you a chance. To, I didn't give you a heads up on these questions. So if you have to think for a second, oh God. that's okay. <laughs> I, I typically warn my guests ahead of time so they can think. My first question is, what's your favorite book? My favorite book is Tribe of Mentors. It's the one that I gift the most to anyone who is ambitious. I really think that a huge part of people's success is, is exposure to those who are more successful because that allows you to understand how they think. It's not so much what they do, but it's, it's their thought processes that make them successful. So I really like, like the ability to access other people's thoughts across a wide range of industries and get like their condensed versions of what they consider to be important. Who wrote that? Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. Awesome. Yeah. I'll definitely go check it out. I love the concept. I liked some of Tim Ferriss's other books, but I hadn't read that. So I'm definitely going to go check it out. The next one, what's your favorite quote? Uh, I love quotes. I'm very cheesy. <laughs> but my favorite quote, if <laughs> you can see I'm like getting embarrassed. My favorite quote, I might jumble it a little bit, but it, 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 it essentially says there are dreamers and there are doers, but what the world needs most are dreamers who do. Oh, nice. I like that one. What's your favorite thing to do outside of work? I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> half the time. Because I mean, like the real estate, the job, I just finished grad school like a year ago. It's like my whole life has been work. But as I start to have more time like the most important thing to me are the people that i have in my life so and especially now moving to indiana you know most of my people are on the east coast so i really like traveling you know we can all kind of get together and take trips and experience new things together food but it's also like experience based and like sharing like breaking bread or new experiences with other people so like traveling fitness food those kinds of things awesome. with good people <laughs> so tell us where our listeners can find out more about you I have a website and I can be reached through that website. It is Griffix Property Group, G R I S S I X, propertygroup.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I learned a ton. I know our listeners too. I love your attitude and I love your outlook towards life and towards business. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. I enjoyed uh, this. Thank you so much for coming. We'll definitely be following you. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to the Rent Roll Radio Show brought to you by Crestworth Capital. We hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please hit the subscribe button and leave us a rating and review. You can also visit us at CrestworthCapital.com or RentRollRadio.com or follow us on Facebook at Rent Roll Radio or at Crestworth Capital. 
If you would like to reach us, feel free to shoot us an email at info at rentrollradio.com or sterling at crestwordcapital.com. We hope you come back next week to join us on some more of our journey. Until then, happy investing. Happy investing.